Hello, I'm Jonathan Field, the Managing Director and one of the founders of PTFS Europe. PTFS Europe was formed in 2007, providing expertise in the library automation market in the UK. And we support over 130 libraries, both in the UK and beyond. And as an organization, we have always been a virtual company. All our staff are based in the UK and they all work from home. And we're delighted to welcome you today to our PTFS Europe Festival, a two hour online conference specifically directed at the needs of the FE sector. Well, we know there's some people online today from other sectors as well, and you're also most welcome. Our festival came about due to a growing interest uh, in the CAO open source library management system, particularly in the further education market. It is a sector that's undergone a lot of changes over the past 10 to 15 years with mergers and many institutions growing in size. And this change has meant that previous library management systems, which were often designed for schools or small colleges, are no longer adequate for institutions that have become large in size and are teaching both FE and in many cases HE courses as well. And for that reason, FE colleges are looking more and more at the Kohar open source library management system as an alternative to their existing system. It's a mature, reliable system and is very cost effective for FE budgets. Koha, which means gift in Maori, is used right across the world and across all different types of libraries of all shapes and sizes. In the UK, we work with large public libraries, government libraries, NHS libraries, right down to small one-man one libraries. And of course, we're very much involved in the FE and the HE sector as well. And today, because of the current lockdown in the UK, we've decided to do something a little bit different, a totally online conference with sessions that we hope you'll find varied and enjoyable. And you're very welcome to stay for the full two hours or dip in, in and out as you please. All of the sessions that we do today will be recorded and they'll be available uh, to view later if you wish to. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Fiona Borthwick, Lucy Vox Harvey, John Turner and Janet McGowan, as well as Andrew Ald uh, from PTFS Europe for putting together the content for today's session. But we're particularly grateful to Sam Goldsmith from the University Centre Leeds and Penny Robertson and George Harkins from the City of Glasgow College for giving up their time and for their excellent contributions. If you have time, I would heartily recommend you look at Sam's research into whether there is a gender difference in the take up of individual skills support. We've provided a link to our online form and I know that should be very grateful if you did have the time to go and have a look at it and complete it if you can. Throughout the afternoon, there will be opportunities to ask questions to all of our speakers. Uh, and we'd request that if you're in the Zoom session, you direct your questions via chat to the Ask Us a Question user. And if you're in YouTube, then feel free to use the live chat facility. And our speakers will be around all afternoon, so please do ask questions as you think of them and as they arise. And if we don't get to answer all the questions, we can uh, answer them subsequently. There will also be a short break before Sam's presentation, just to allow you a time for a quick comfort break and to refill your coffee mug. We hope you enjoy our conference today. So now we move on to the introductory session where I will be talking to Andrew Ald about the power of open source and the emergence of open source software in the library automation market over the past 10 to 15 years. So I'm Andrew Ald. I've joined Jonathan for this session on the power of open source software. 
there might be some of you in the audience who haven't really heard much about open source software. So, uh, Jonathan, perhaps you could explain a little bit to all of us um, what it is. Yeah, so open source software is software that's uh, written and distributed under a free license. So what that means in practice is that anybody can take that code, uh, they can adapt that code, uh, or they can use that code as part of something else that they're producing. And the rights of the license, and there, there are quite a few open source licenses out there, allow people to do that. And it's not uncommon when you meet people, maybe less so these days, but not uncommon that uh, people will look at you blankly when you talk about open source. But if I just take a few examples and um, show you a couple of examples that you, you might sort of be familiar with in your day-to-day -day life. So, I mean, if I say to you, Andrew, have you heard of WordPress, Google Chrome, then, uh, you know, have you heard of those applications? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure most people are using those in their day-to-day -day life. I mean, obviously WordPress massively, hugely used blogging platform. Uh, but if we think in the context of the uh, further education sector in particular, there's a wide adoption of things like Moodle uh, as a virtual learning environment and also uh, Shibboleth uh, in the context of authentication. And I guess what a lot of people don't realize is that a large part of the, the sort of web that we use day in, day out, so you know, these sort of large websites that we use regularly are built on open source platforms, often Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and Perl. And, um, and even in our sort of personal lives, I mean, you know, you're a musician, I'm a musician, I regularly use Audacity uh, for editing, uh, music uh, that I might have recorded and want to edit and adapt. Uh, so people think it's not commonly day-to-day uh, -day stuff, but it actually, it is. It's in use in all our everyday lives. I've heard though that there's some resistance to open source and possibly even misinformation about it. Would you say that's true? Yeah, very much so. Um, and we, again, we kind of think of that as something perhaps from the past and uh, is something that is not so common now, but we still see it. I mean, this is a, an example of, uh, you know, on a website recently, and uh, it's the sort of what, what we describe as uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So putting fear, uncertainty, and doubt in people's minds about open source. So... Uh, it even goes as far as sort of talking about stealing your data, uh, which is, you know, a ridiculous kind of statement, really, particularly in this day and age when, when it is so widely used and adopted. Uh, so it is a total sort of misunderstanding, really, of what, what free software is. And free with open source, okay, it's not completely free. I think most people who understand open source realize that, that open source software is not totally free. But, the software is free, but there's a cost of ownership behind that, and I think that's widely uh, understood and um, by most people now. But, but obviously, some of the fear and uncertainty and doubt that's put into people's head uh, is really has no basis whatsoever. Right, and and um, is, despite this sort of fear and uncertainty and doubt being spread about the place, uh, do, do the proprietary software companies? Uh, do they avoid using open source software? Do they not use any open source in their software at all? Well, I guess that's part of the irony of, of open source software is that uh, amongst proprietary vendors, you find it is widely used in their applications. So again, just picking out some examples, uh, the Apache web server, uh, the JBoss engine, Elasticsearch, MySQL, uh, these are all tools that are used day in, day out in, in uh, applications and, you know, regularly used in proprietary applications. And again, you've probably been on, onto websites that are commercial websites and in the URL bar, you'll see that they, one of the file extensions will be a PHP file extension. So uh, there's plenty of examples out there. And, um, and that is kind of the irony, really, that, that proprietary vendors do use open source all the time, right. uh, even though they... To suggest that there is um, uh, this sort of problem behind it. 
Okay, so so focusing a bit more on the library uh, automation market now, um, is open source uh, library management systems or library solutions, are they relatively new to the market now? Well, the Koha library management system is is hugely mature. I mean, it's, it's 20 years old this year. Uh, it's used right across the world. It's used in probably around about 15,000 uh, libraries worldwide. From the heat map you can see on the screen now, you can see it's used widely in uh, Africa, India, China, and, and so it goes on. It's, it's very widely used. Uh, the other open source library application we work with, Folio, that's a much newer application. That's only been around three or four years. So in terms of uh, its maturity compared to Co, it's very new. But again, uh, the open source projects that work well are projects that have large uptake and adoption. And that's certainly been true of the Folio project. It's again been widely adopted. It's widely supported by commercial companies and uh, libraries, university libraries, and so on. Is that um, is that the International Space Station use it out in space? Is that that uh, little green dot? <laughs> dot there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We're inter intergalactic. Excellent. Excellent. Um, given that um, open source software is is developed um, by developers and and um, they don't have to be necessarily paid developers, uh, developers right across the world, um, can libraries be assured that it's trusted and secure? Yeah, I mean, in, again, interestingly enough, if we go back to um, 2014, uh, the government at the time put out a uh, document, the Cabinet Office and the Home Office put out a document called All About Open Source. And um, it didn't say go out and use open source, but what it did say is that in your procurement exercise, you should at least, at the very least, be considering open source uh, as, a, as an option because of, the, of all the benefits that we know about open source, the cost effectiveness and all the other benefits. Um, and that's still true now. If you go onto the current um, you know, government website, there's plenty of information about open source as well. So uh, it's trusted at the government level. But in terms of us as a company, uh, you know, we are an ISO 27001 accredited company. It's a difficult accreditation to get. Uh, you have to be re-accredited every year. Uh, the, the testing is very thorough and it, it tests everything from the way you handle your software and, and the hardware side of things right down to how you handle staff uh, and your day-to-day -day procedures. Um, and across our customer bases, we have customers you know, working in all different types of sectors. Uh, and many of these sectors are sectors that are concerned about these sort of issues. So we work with government libraries, we work with higher education, we work with international law firms and so on. Uh, so it's, it's an important issue and um, I think as, as, it, as it says in the, um, as Bilbo Baggins says in the Lord, Lord of the Rings, it's a dangerous business, Frodo going out your door. And I guess that, that is true. It's that uh, there's security uh, issues around us all the time. And actually what it's about is how we, you mitigate uh, any issues. And of course, that's, that doesn't just apply to open source software, that applies to proprietary software as well. So it's how you handle that, the procedures in place. Okay, so you mentioned on uh, the previous slide uh, just how widely Koha is being used uh, globally and uh, uh, how um, it's been embraced as, a, as a, a library management system right across the world. So how, how does that Koha community work in practice? Yeah, so the, the Koha community is it's a massive global community. Uh, as I've said earlier, there's 15,000 plus libraries using Koha worldwide. So it's, it is a big community. And, and obviously the success of open source projects really depend on their uptake. Obviously in the UK, we're very much behind supporting Koha, but uh, there's other companies of similar size and standing as us in uh, mainland Europe and in the US and uh, 
New Zealand, Australia, and, and beyond, really. So, uh, and amongst those companies, they all have a support presence, they all have a development presence, uh, and we have uh, several developers working full time on COA, and a lot of these other companies do as well. So, when you bring all that resource together, you actually have a very big pool of people uh, writing code, sorting out bugs, QAing the software, writing documentation, and so it goes on. Do libraries get involved in the development then? Very much so, yeah. yeah. So we have, I mean, in, in the UK, uh, as is the case in many parts of the world, you tend to have local uh, requirements that, that apply to your region specifically. And a lot of our libraries in the UK, they, they often club together and uh, sponsor development that's, that's specific to their market spaces. Great. So, so what's PCFS Europe's role in all of this? Well, strangely enough, our role is, is not dissimilar to if you were working with a proprietary uh, vendor. So we do all the things you would expect us to do, really, project management, the installation and configuration of the software, uh, migrating the data from one system, a, a legacy system, to the current system is a big part of it. We do the training. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, all our staff are based in the UK, so that's, that's local trainers on site. Uh, and as I just mentioned, we do a lot of software development as well as a company, uh, and obviously ongoing hosting of, of the, the systems and a sort of help test system as well. Great. You mentioned a few organisations that PTFS Europe works with, but uh, tell us a bit more about uh, who we work with. Yeah, so obviously today we're to really talking about the further education uh, sector and we have a, a lot of libraries and I've, I've got a sort of list of some of them here uh, in that sector, but we're obviously working outside of these sectors and one of the beauties of COA is it's very adaptable to all shapes and sizes of libraries. So we work with big public libraries. As I mentioned, we work with government libraries, NHS libraries, museum libraries. Um, uh, but in the context of today, we work in higher education, but we also work very much in uh, further education, which is a big sector for us. Great. Well, just to, just to sum up, perhaps, uh, Jonathan, what, what would you say are the, the key benefits then of an open source solution? Yeah, well, I guess the one that people always think about, and uh, as I said earlier, Koha, uh, the cost of using Koha is, is not free, but the license is, is free itself. So it's definitely cost effective. Uh, that, that's for certain. We rarely find that it's not cost effective. Um, so that's, that would be one of the, or the biggest benefit, I guess, uh, of open source software. But I, I guess the other advantage is the sort of rapid development of the software because there is this big community behind it and because uh, users are directing the, the, the sort of direction of the software, then there's a big benefit for the end user because they can actually have a say in where the software is going. So they don't have to wait for years uh, for something that they've been hoping for not to appear in the software, uh, which is often what you, you, have, you do have happen. Uh, you do get rigorous sort of QA in the software. So again, I mentioned there's a, a, a lot of people working on COA and it's the thing that people say about open source. You have many eyes looking at the software uh, from many different organizations. Um, so, so that's a big benefit of, this, of open source. And I guess finally, it's, it, it, it is in a way, it is the future. It is the direction of travel if you think of uh, some of the big, large organizations out there, uh, they're choosing to develop their platforms on open source software. So we can take people like, you know, who you all have heard of, like Facebook, who developed uh, React and Redux as their user interface. And it's, it's widely used in all sorts of applications. And as it happens, it's being used in the Folio uh, library services platform as the, as the front end interface. You have people like Twitter who developed the Bootstrap framework, the responsive framework to deploy their applications. And again, that's widely used in all sorts of applications uh, within libraries and outside of libraries. And you go through to people like the BBC who do a huge amount of research and development and most of their 
uh, software that they're producing is produced under open source licenses for free distribution. Well, great, Jonathan. That's that's given us all a really good uh, overview of uh, what open source is about and uh, and why it's a, of interest perhaps to some of the people uh, watching this today. Um, as with all the sessions today, uh, if you have any questions, please make sure you're using the uh, the chat in um, in Zoom to ask a question. There's an ask a question user. If you just ask your question as a direct message. Uh, we'll try and respond to as many questions as possible. Jonathan's around all afternoon, uh, and so we'll be able to answer any questions you have about the detail of what you've just seen. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Great, thanks. Hi, my name is Fiona and I'm Customer Relationship Manager at PTFS Europe. My role is very varied, but two key components of my work is that I work alongside new customers on implementing the Koha Library Management System and also going forward, I look after our entire customer base across all sectors. My presentation today is to provide you with a brief overview of Koha and talk about some of its fantastic features that work with the open source community. Okay, so first of all, Koha originated in New Zealand in 1999, so it's a relatively mature system now. It does, to the term Koha means gift, it's a Maori term and it really sums up the ethos of, of Koha. Um, it's, it's open source, therefore there are no licensing restrictions and indeed you, it is free software that you can download and install yourself. One of the massive advantages that Koha has over other systems is that it is fully web-based and indeed it has been from its inception, both the OPAC and the staff interface. There is a worldwide community that looks after Koha and that ranges from developers to librarians to support staff and they all work together on new features and generally keep Koha very up to date and take on board any feedback from any of, the, of its users. With all the work that's carried out on Koha, it is fed automatically back into the core product. So absolutely every Koha user can take full advantage and reaps all the benefits from all the work that's carried out from everybody across the globe. There are two major releases annually, but PTFS Europe would recommend an annual upgrade. Um, but that does ensure that as our customers, you are being kept up to date with all the new enhancements and functionality that's been added to the product. Koha as a library management system is very rich in functionality. It's modular, so it has modules available for all your standard library functions. So for example, there's a circulation module, there is a serials module, there's a reports module, etc. As delivered, you do have access to all the modules, but going forward, your staff logins would then dictate what permissions you had to the system. So some of those areas, like the Koha administration area, for example, you would want to tightly control who had access to that. 
Koha as a product is also very highly configurable and I'm sure all our existing customers would agree that they're offered a huge raft of tools and are very are able to are very easily able to make changes that take effect immediately and are able to control the appearance and behaviour of Koha to meet their library needs. One of its other highly desirable features is that both the staff interface and the OPAC use responsive technology. So that does mean, of course, that you can re the, the screen will resize itself to, depending upon the device that you're using. So whether it be a laptop screen or an iPad screen or, or a mobile phone. So that does remove the need to have um, a separate app. So I'll just provide a very quick demonstration on, on that for you. And this is using our de demo system, so using our OPAC. So this gives you a quick look at our demonstration system, where we have it branded in the middle with a cover flow and we've got navigational links down the left-hand side and so on. I want to draw your attention to this, this option at the top to log into your account with the person and the text. And the way that this is displayed with the search index appearing at the left-hand side, search box in the middle, and the option to select the library at the right-hand side. So I'm just going to enter in a search term, good old economics, my go-to search term. And this is how the search results screen will display by default using my screen, which is a laptop. So you can see that the search results appear two thirds of the screen. You've got the options to place reservations and so on at the bottom. And we've got our facets at the left hand side, allowing us to refine our search. To show you how it adjusts itself, if I click on this to, to change its appearance. And then if I just pull it in slightly, you can see that it's starting to resize and move about. And when I scroll to the top, the text to log into your account is no longer there, but the little person icon is. And I think that's pretty standard across websites nowadays that you, people would know to use that for logging in. Our facets have disappeared from the left-hand side, and now we've got a link to refine our search, which if we clicked on that would give us our facets to, to allow us to filter. And we can see that our search results have been presented, you know, they've gone closer into the middle of the screen. If I pull it in a little bit more as if I was going to be working on a mobile phone, you can see again, it resizes itself accordingly and our search box um, with the library and the index selectors are now appearing underneath each other on this display. And when we scroll down again, you can see that the search results have resized and you've got your links that I showed you before appearing as separate buttons. OK, so that just gives you a quick idea of, of how the, the Koha OPAC can be resized easily. So I'll just go back to our presentation. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how easy Koha is to navigate. As it's web-based, you can move between records very easily. You can always use your browser back to return you to various places. But even within records, it's incredibly easy to navigate. So I just thought the best way to describe that to you is simply to show you. So I'll just click in my staff site. So this is our staff interface. And as I said in the previous slide, it's very rich in functionality and offers access to all different modules. So this gives you an example of the buttons that are available to you here. But for the purpose of this quick demo, I'm just going to look up my user record. And once I'm in my user record, you can see, as you would expect, that you can have access into the loans area. So you can see what I've got out on loan. And each of these acts as hyperlinks. So we've got a link into our title, a link into our item record, for example. Um, so let me just use this one. I'll just click on the, the title and it's pulled it through for me. 
Um, from here, if I wanted to, I could navigate back into the user record. Incidentally, because it is browser-based, there's no limit to the number of tabs that you, you work with. So if a preferred way of working is to, is to have multiple tabs, you can do that. So for example, if I click my name on the link and click to open the link in the new tab, there we go. I've got my, my user record in one tab and the catalog record in a second tab. From here also, I can click on subject heading. So if I wanted to see what else was in this um, particular genre, then I can action that without having to repeat my search. So again, I can open the link in a new tab and I get my catalog results. Okay. So there's no limit to the number of tabs you want to work with, or you can use them all from within the one record if, if you wanted to. And again, just to show, I can go into the, the specific copy record if I wanted to at this point by clicking on the barcode to make any changes. So for example, if I wanted to mark this one as a missing item, then, then I can do so very easily without having to, to actually go through an edit procedure. Okay, back to the presentation. Um, I mentioned before about a, that there's a reports module with Koha. And I should stress that the reporting module is very functionally rich. Every field within every record is stored in the Koha database. So in theory, you should be able to get all that information out. It does store it using a MySQL database but you don't need to be an SQL expert in order to write your own reports. The PTFS Europe Help Desk will assist you with report writing, but in addition to that, the Koha community have produced a reports library, which is continually added to by members um, of the Koha world. So we've, we come into this page and we've got separate tabs specifically for reports for holds, patrons and circulation. But those aside, just scrolling down gives you an idea of how many reports there are that we can then use. Now, because it's a, a web page as well, we can search for it. So if we're looking for something in particular, we can do a search to locate um, to locate that. So here's an example, count of URLs from 856, or if I want to go to the next one, we can get a list of URLs. So if that's what I'm interested in, I could then say that I'll just copy that SQL and paste it in as my query when I run my own report. Obviously, there may be some changes that you need to make to make it specific to your library, but it is a very good starting point. And certainly as at PTFS, always look to the library before we start writing our own reports. Why, you know, why reinvent the wheel when there's something already there? I previously mentioned that Koha was highly configurable, but you can take it one step further if you wish, and you can apply some jQuery or CSS or HTML to both the staff interface and the OPAC. So those with that, those bits of uh, coding would allow you to make necessary changes like changing colors or changing labels, adding buttons, inserting some content, putting links in places, etc. And yes, if you're familiar with those bits of code, you can go on and do them yourself. The PTFS Europe Help Desk will also provide support in those areas. And once again, there are libraries available through the Koha community. So for example, here is our jQuery library. So I hope you're, you're realizing that uh, the Koha is more, it, it's a big team that looks after it and everybody works together. And I think that really benefits everybody. Um, Support companies like ourselves take a, you know, really benefit from that as well as our individual customers. Yeah. My final slide is looking at integrations. Now, Koha obviously is a library management system, but in modern libraries, a whole raft of other systems are used in everyday life. 
we're very proud to be able to offer integration services for COHA to talk to these other systems and we will work with you during the implementations to set these up. However, people would maybe defer some of these areas or going forward would maybe want to start introducing some of them. So the integration side of it can be done at any time. This slide just lists some of the most common integrations um, and we're always interested in hearing about new projects as well. So for example, one of the key areas that we, we're asked to integrate with is discovery platforms. So typically, EBSCO Discovery Service, Summon, Viewfind, and Lucy is actually going to, to provide a quick demo of the EDS integration in her presentation. More and more libraries now offer self-issue units so that their, the library members can check items out for themselves without having to come to a counter. And we help with setting that, them up um, using the SIP2 technology. Similarly with the, the lap safe lockers for, for laptops, so if you're interested in pursuing that, we're more than happy to work with you on, on that basis. Overdue notices, um, hold pickup notices, etc. Can, can be emailed out to the users, but if you're interested in sending them via text message, then we can do some integration work there. And very crucially within the sectors, we have authentication methods using LDAP, Shibboleth, SAML. We've got experience of integrating with all of those. And similarly with a student registry, we can have regular feeds going um, from your, your student registry system into COHA. Um, and we can use EDI for acquisitions and a couple of others at the bottom there to do with finances. Koha comes with PayPal as standard, so that can just be enabled and you can use start using PayPal as providing you for a merchant account. But we can integrate with some other e-payment systems out there, like Capita, Civic Card payment systems, etc. We can also integrate with um, a finance system for, for paying invoices, etc. when it comes to acquisitions. So this is just a brief list of integration projects that we have worked with in the past, but I'm sure there's plenty more that we'd be willing to take on as well. So a very quick overview of the Koha Library Management System. I hope you found it useful. I'm happy to take questions. Hi, my name is Lucy and I'm a Customer Support Consultant and Project Lead with PTFS Europe. My talk today is COA, the right system for an FE college. Each FE college we work with is very different and has its own priorities and specific requirements, so it's actually really difficult to pick out particular functionality that works for all colleges. But I've just picked a few areas today that I hope will give you an idea of why FE colleges are choosing COA and how they're using the system. So firstly, I'm going to have a look at the staff interface and I'm going to show you the core circulation features and system administration modules. And then I'm going to move on to the public catalogue and OPAC and show you an example of an integration with another system. In this case, EBSCO's Discovery Service or EDS. And finally, if there's time, I'll also have a look at the My Account feature on the OPAC, which is where students can view their loans and make reservations um, and renewals. 
Okay, so firstly, let's have a look at the staff interface. The owner has already shown you the staff interface, so you'll be familiar with this home screen. The first thing that I wanted to highlight was the core circulation functions. So, check out, check in, renew, search patrons and search the catalogue are all available from this search box at the top of the screen. You simply tab in between the options, between the functions, uh, in order to use them. So the search box can accept scanned barcodes or you can enter keyword searches depending on the function that you're using. Um, so it's really easy to use, it's really accessible for staff um, and we get really positive feedback um, when we show library staff this for the, for the first time as it's so easy to use. There are other functions obviously within circulation and you can get to those if you need them from the circulation module here um, but I think it's a really nice feature that you can access these sort of core circulation functions so easily within COA. The second area of the staff interface that I wanted to look at was systems administration. So your systems administration in COA um, is in two separate modules, so COA administration module here and the tools module. COA administration is home to all your system configuration, your policies and your settings and the tools module contains sort of more task-based um, activities, so things like batch editing, records or items, uploading files of marked records perhaps for ebooks, that kind of thing. The reason that I'm highlighting systems administration on COA is because I'm aware that in a lot of FE colleges you probably don't have the luxury of a full-time systems administrator. Uh, quite often a number of staff have to dip in and do bits of systems administration at certain times um, and also your staff quite often are working at different sites or different desks uh, or being pulled in several different directions so you might be covering the, the counter at lunchtime or, or that kind of thing. So I think the way that systems administration works in COA is it's really easily laid out, it's very task-based, uh, it's very open, it's very easy for you to see different areas um, so it is easy for you to sort of pick up um, and manage when you've got lots of other things to do. So just have very, very quickly just have a, have a look at those two modules. So this is your current administration. As I say, it's laid out into different groupings. So you've got sort of basic area here, basic parameters, then you've got patrons and circulation, type configuration, and you've got catalog configuration, and then further down sort of other areas. If I just pop into one of them, just so that you can have a look, I'll look at the patron categories. So this is where all your different types of patrons would be listed with all the different um, values for, for each of those different types. So here you've got a code and a category name, so different types of, of, of staff and student. And very, very easy just to edit any one of those from the edit button here, so you can go in and change those credentials. Um, changes are instant, so any new patrons created after you've made changes are obviously instantly pick up those those new changes and you can add new a new category very easily as well from the bottom here so it's very clear very easy very well laid out if I go back home and go into the tools menu again just to show you really because we don't have time to do anything in any great detail again split out into patrons and circulation type tasks then catalog tasks um, and then and then others like and here under catalogue you can see you've got your batch item modification, batch record deletion and modification. Further down here I'll point out the stage mark records for import again, so some of my colleges do uh, quite regularly. So importing um, files of records of ebooks or other online resources. So again, very clearly laid out, easy for you to dip into and dip out of. Okay, so that's really all I've got time to show you on the staff interface. I'm going to move out onto the public catalogue or OPAC now. The first thing I wanted to show you on the OPAC is the EBSCO Discovery Service or EDS plugin to COA, which uses an API to integrate search results from EDS into the COA OPAC. 
these type of integrations help to achieve the joined up service that you want to provide to college staff and students. So I thought it would be useful to look at one of these today. So I'm looking at the Leeds College of Music OPAC here. They've kindly agreed to let me show you their test site. They're currently implementing COA and they're going to go live later on in the summer. Um, but they do have the EDS plugin set up already, so um, I can show you that here. So the EDS plugin works by adding another option into the, the OPAC search. If I click on the drop down here that says catalogue, I've got this option to switch to discovery. And if I click on there, it's actually changing so that I'm searching the EDS plugin rather than the library catalogue. <coughs> I've got a search that's come up here, music production technology. So I'm just going to search for that. And as you can see, it's returned a large number of results. This is because it's searching the, the full EDS service in the background. The filters that I've got down the left hand side are the filters that you would expect to see within EDS itself. Um, and then within the search results, um, you've got the links out to the EDS resources. So um, it, in the vast majority of cases, those are going to be online resources. So you've got a link here to an ebook, um, another ebook here, then further down, view record from Oxford University Press, view record at Oxback pages. So, the, so it's showing you the database that it's finding the records in and if you click on those um, obviously you're going to be brought to an authentication page for you to log in so that you can log into those different services via EDS. You can narrow the search back down just to the library catalogue so if I click on this filter here it's searched again just within the Leeds College of Music catalogue and I've just got much fewer results here, just 23 results. There is an advanced search available as well within the, the plugin. So if I click on advanced search here, you're now seeing an advanced search which again contains the options that you would see if you were searching within um, the native EDS um, interface. So it's slightly different to the advanced search just within the code catalog. So that's how the um, EDS plugin works. The next thing I'm going to look at is um, the My Account feature within the OPAC. So I've just gone back to the home screen and I'm now going to log in to My Account. So the reason for showing you this really is that um, I know one of the the, um, the big focuses for, for an FE college library is to engage students and to make sure that they're studying well and using the learning resources. Um, so I just wanted to show you this screen just to show you how sort of clear and concise it is, how well laid out. So, um, you know, if students do log into the OPAC and use the OPAC, they can see very clearly here which checkouts they've got, if any are overdue, any charges they may have. They can also manage their holds or reservations from this screen as well. <clears throat> so it's really simply just to show you that, just to show you the layout and show you what's available. If I go back to the home screen, once I am logged in to the OPAC, You'll see also you get this little dashboard as well. So students can see quite clearly from here um, what transactions they might have with the library at any one time. And these are just hyperlinks so that they can click through and see more detail if they need to. So that was really all I was going to show you today. Really just a very quick overview um, of COA and just certain features which I think work particularly well for FE colleges. Um, obviously there is a lot more that, that you could look at in a more detailed demo. Um, so thank you very much for your time and I think there may be time for questions so I look forward to, to, um, to having some questions from you if you've got any on, on the chat. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, so this session is going to be all about uh, COA implementation. And um, in this case, we're talking about the implementation at Leeds City College. And I'm delighted that we've got with us um, Sam Goldsmith from Leeds City College, who's going to tell us all about why they uh, chose COA for their implementation and uh, how, how that went. Perhaps before you get started on that, uh, Sam, if you could tell us a little bit more about Leeds City College itself first. Yeah, no problem. We are a very large college, one of the largest in the country. Um, there's about 26,000 students in the FE part alone, but the group, the Luminate group, is um, also includes a lot about five schools, uh, Harrogate College, Leeds uh, College of Music. So very big and growing every year. And uh, at its largest, the library department itself, um, or LRCs, included seven sites, which was which was one for every campus, and about 32 staff. Um, currently, there are two large LRCs, um, two small ones, and um, a HE library, and then lots and lots of smaller uh, independent learning zones. Okay, and does, does Leeds uh, specialise in, in any particular courses or is it a, a fairly general uh, set of courses that you offer at Leeds? Very, very wide in general, all the usual vocational, but also we've got a large uh, A-level department, a separate school which um, is in, in part of the college where uh, younger students from age 14 can elect to come to us instead of finishing their school years in school. So very, very broad. A lot of um, ESOL and um, also foundation learning. But yeah, we cover pretty much everything that you would expect from an FE college and, and perhaps a little bit more. Okay. Great. So before COA, um, what systems did you have in place at the LRCs to manage your collections? We had heritage for an awful lot of years, um, long, long time. And we'd just put in place EBSCO Discovery as well. Okay. And, and what, what were the main reasons you were looking to change systems then? There, there were many and varied really, but um, obviously the first one that pops to mind and is an issue for most people is the costs. Um, so our funding was going down year by year. It was be going to become more departmentally driven. So we were really concerned that we had to have systems that were very efficient, very cheap, um, you know, so that we could sell it to the departments. And also we knew that we were becoming a Google education college. A lot more of our stuff had to be cloud-based and the spaces were going to be changing drastically. The pictures that you're showing now show how we had to change those spaces. Um, they, they were becoming, they were going to be less library, traditional shared library spaces and more of these independent learning zones, which may, not, may or may not be staffed. Um, some would be staffed only on a, temporary basis or very very rarely in the week right okay and um, were there any reasons at the time why changing systems might have been difficult yeah there were quite a number of um, obstacles if you might see them like that one was that our data we because we'd had heritage for 20 odd years um, our data was in a very poor state because it was a mixture from lots of previous um, systems and colleges and other organisations that had joined us. So it, it wasn't even in, in mark standard. Also, we knew that we would have quite a lot of staff resistance because we'd gone through such a, a major changes, including a reorganisation. So their um, tolerance for change was very low at the time. Um, we also suffered from the fact that because we'd had the previous system for so long that the knowledge of that system by our IT support, our internal IT support was next to zero at that stage to the point where we'd not been able to do any updates to the system because no one had the knowledge to do it. Um, so yeah, quite quite a lot of these barriers were in place at the time. We also were, knew that we were going to face 
um, having less managed spaces and how we were going to do that. It seemed virtually impossible with the existing system, but we knew we were going to have to go through quite a lot of turmoil to get to where we needed to be. So did the, the changes to the spaces that we're seeing um, on the screen here, did they happen before the, the, the library system implementation or, or was it part and parcel of the same project? How was the timing of that? Yeah, we, um, we put in the need to change um, as, as very early on so that we were prepared for the physical changes that would be coming um, because we wanted our staff that to, to have a presence in these many and varied spaces, which meant that they had to be much more mobile. So we needed systems that would work on a little Chromebook with a handheld scanner that, so that they could actually be present in the spaces. It, it would not suit the traditional um, stuck at a counter type scenario. So we made sure that we did the implementation way before the physical changes were ready. Okay, and, and you obviously then went through a, um, a selection process of some kind, a tender process of some kind, and during that, what were the main reasons then for choosing COA as the system of choice? Well, I'd uh, previously worked at the Department of Health and they'd gone with open source um, COHA before, and I really appreciated um, the options that gave us in terms of learning the systems and becoming kind of experts ourselves because we'd had such a bad experience with the IT support internally. Um, that, so that was my first reason for asking people to think about it. And then we, um, we liked the fact that it could be managed by PTFS Europe um, and that the servers would no longer be our problem either because you know they, they become ancient no one really cares and you're stuck with these these systems that really don't do the job um and um to be fair it was going to be half the cost the half the annual cost so um yeah those were the reasons and also we knew that the coha system would be um z3950 compliant which meant that which we hadn't had previously which meant that all those systems that that involves so much staff time in ad administrative, you know, in administrative things, in, in getting the books processed into the system, cataloging and so yeah. on, that would would not would likely not be able to happen in the new in the new organisation of the service because we would not have that professional knowledge in every at every site, which would would be necessary using our old technologies. Yeah. So those were the main reasons. It, it basically matched our needs. It did what we wanted it to do, matched our needs, but also looked to have a lot more flexibility in terms of what we would need in the future. Okay, great. And uh, the implementation itself then, how, how did that go and who, who got involved in that process at the college? Yeah, it, it went pretty smoothly. I mean, the we did have some issues over the um, implementation, but as it turned out in the end, those issues were mainly internal problems. So um, we had to involve our IT team, otherwise they would have been very upset with us and perhaps not help us in future. So we, they had to be involved in the implementation and they were a little bit of a blocker, to be fair. Other than that, the implementation did go very smoothly. It went on time. Um, we did find that there were some issues, for instance, we were a bit concerned early on that we were having quite a lot of downtime because obviously it's a, an, an online, you know, it's a, a web based um, system. But it turns out that that was because our uh, internal IT were so worried about security that they had so many uh, blocks in place, right. ins and outs, that actually it was us that was causing the problem and once that was removed and fixed, um, it took a long time for us to, to get them to admit that that was the case. But once that was fixed, um, it was actually a lot better. So, um, yeah, it was it went really smoothly. Actually, we were worried about it because of the state of our data and so on. But um, but they 
but PTFS Europe worked with us to try and organise that data as best we could before it went ahead. And then we had a lot of data checks where they would do a batch and then let us just show us it so that we could see if it was matching what we needed or not. So it, yeah, it went really well. And did you involve the um, LRC staff in, in the implementation process? Was it quite a wide team that got involved? Yeah. We we previously put in place a systems person, which I have to say was was brilliant. Um, so we now we now have a person that really does learn the system in and out and can help us with most of the daily issues and so on. So that system person was very highly involved, but also all of the librarians had a a kind of strata of training that was appropriate to them, and then um, and then. The, you know, the other staff would also have their appropriate training and then we cascaded it wider as well. So some, also some of the curriculum staff were involved in our cascaded training. Um, we tried to make as many people aware of it as possible before it actually went live as well. But we gave ourselves quite a short timetable um, to be um, live. So we gave ourselves the summer to integrate the data and so on with the expectation that we would be ready to go like a week before um, the students were back. And uh, did you hit that? We did. Great. But um, in a way, I wish we'd waited a little while until we found out about these issues that our own internal IT support was causing because that gave our staff a lot of stressful situations where they were convinced it was because the system was failing and yeah. students wanted things and they couldn't give them it. So in, I wish I'd given a little bit longer for the process so that we could have a lot more test, testing before we uh, returned. A lot of our staff are actually term time only, of course, so they were only literally back a couple of weeks before that, before the actual live time. Okay, so that, that's something you'd possibly do differently. Is there anything else about the process that you think you'd do differently with hindsight? No, I think, um, I think everything else went pretty well. Um, I don't think there was anything else we could have done. We wouldn't have known about the issues popping up until it happened. Um, uh, but knowing, you've got to know how your own internal system support, your own IT support will react, what their normal time scale would be um, and, and kind of fit them in, I think, which is something we didn't do with hindsight. Yeah. And um, how's it worked out overall? What, what bits of COA have you found to be most beneficial? Uh, the most obvious benefit is that it does everything that the system did beforehand and plus more. So um, it's, it's half the cost, it's easier to sell to the curriculum areas, the, all the records and things can be automatically loaded before the items arrive. Um, it works really well with our little independent roaming Chromebooks. Um, it also, uh, because it has got a good network of other users, you've got a lot more adaptability and you can modify the system how you like. You can also share other people's modifications if you like those too. Um, so yeah, it's been really good. We're, we're very happy with it now. I think the staff were a little bit reticent at first, but now if I was to tell them we were going to swap again, they'd be very unhappy. So. <laughs> You know, I think I think just it, it is generally change. I think that people sometimes can be a bit slow with. We all don't like change. No. So it might be a good idea to just have a quick look at the uh, the home screen, uh, the the sort of front end, if you like, of uh, of your library system, um, which uh, should be coming up on the screen now. Mm -hmm. So perhaps uh, Sam, if you could just tell us a bit about how. Uh, the COA system works in in practice? Yes, so um, the students never actually see the COHA background screen, we just use that for staff um, use, that's their integration point, but the, the students actually just use the uh, website, which is being a Google Education College, it is a Google site, um, and the search box appears prominently on here and on their own classrooms, and the search box 
uh, links Koha in with our um, discovery service. So it's all integrated in with our, it's not just the catalogue, it's also all our subscriptions and our online ebooks, etc. Okay, so you're using EBSCO's EDS um, to search the COA catalogue as well as your, your electronic resources. Yeah, and I think students prefer that. They prefer, they, they, they're used to, it's the age of Google, so they're used to having just the one search box for their topic. Yeah. I mean, we do then train them or try to train them on how to kind of uh, interrogate that system better than perhaps just a few keywords. But yeah, they do prefer just the one search place. Great. Okay, and overall, um, looking at the project as a whole, how was it working with PTFS Europe? What was the experience like? And uh, I guess to the audience here, would you recommend it? <laughs> and they were really good. Um, they, they're a very small team and we were given our own team to help us through the integration and uh, our own trainer as well. Um, there, was, there was an awful lot of work to prepare our data, which I can't underplay. It was all in an awful state. Um, and the support has been very good in reaction to issues as well, much swifter than the previous LMS system. Um, so we literally can, we, we've also got more modes of contacting them, it would seem. So we can call, which was the traditional method, and then wait and then be put on a list of people that would be called back at some point. Now we can call, we can also message. Um, it's all m much more seamless. It's quicker and m more efficient. Um, and, and you've got a lot of integrations with other FE colleges as well, which is great because you've got quite a lot of knowledge of the sort of issues we're likely to have that are unique to us, like our um, student data, for example, you know, having to work with our MIS systems, for example. So, yeah, really good, really knowledgeable and really helpful. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Sam. Uh, it's really been great to hear about uh, the Leeds City College and the wider, um, the wider group's uh, use of COA. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to many years to come of uh, our relationship with you. Thanks You're welcome. Much. Thank you, Andrew. So if anyone's got any questions just now for Sam uh, or on any of the presentations, the other presentations, as before, if you just use the, the chat um, in either the Zoom session that you're in or on the YouTube um, live stream, and uh, Sam is around and uh, we'll be able to answer any questions you have on the implementation and how it might go for you. Hello there, uh, welcome. My name is John Turner. I'm the um, Infrastructure Manager at PTFS Europe. 
I'm going to, uh, in the next few minutes, tell you a little bit about the um, uh, LMS hosting solution that, that we provide. And the title of the talk is Technical Challenges of Supporting a Cloud LMS. Um, let's move over to the topics that um, we'll be discussing. Firstly, I'll describe the onboarding process, all the services that we can provide to you. The ad then we'll move to the advantages and disadvantages of a hosted LMS solution. And then we'll look at some of the planned enhancements for our services. One of the w reasons why um, the COA um, software is uh, easy to install is that it uses the Linux um, apt package system where so literally we've got just two commands to run from the command line to get you a fully functioning system up and running. Uh, Koa uses some of the stable components that are the core of the Linux distribution so um, if there are problems found in, in those components, such as the database or the web server, it's likely that they will get fixed well before um, those issues are, are, are raised by yourselves. Um, also, to help with the simplicity of the installation is that co has got a clear and stable release cycle. So we know exactly the problems uh, of, of, of the software because a lot of our team are working with the development of it so that we can make sure that you're given a version that's suitable for your needs and hasn't got any of the, any of the books uh, that can be found in early releases. Um, so what one thing we say is that uh, within a matter of minutes we can give you a fully functioning library management system straight out to the box. So you, you'll have a, uh, a server with a DNS entry, an SSL certificate, email delivery, which will use local authentication um, to, to, to connect to the COA server. Uh, we'll have a full backup cycle, no client software needs to be installed and we also provide upgrades to the operating system and LMS included. So we can get you very quickly up and running. Most customers won't just want the, 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 what we call the, the, the defaults. There are one or two things that we, we're, we're happy to add um, so, so that you could use your own uh, URLs. Uh, if you add a, a DNS record, we could start using your, your, your URLs. Uh, also with the SSL certificates we can we can add your SSL certificates so that uh, uh, again you can use an ac.uk um, domain name on, on all URLs and similarly there's um, uh, email address uh, address for notifications we can we can use those so they appear to come from your domain so the, the, there's some quick changes that we can make from that out of the box system into something that's a little bit more uh, configured and customized for you. So um, included on this is that uh, there's a large array of integrations that let your LMS talk to the outside world and the outside world interact with your LMS. So um, we can provide uh, ex what we call external in, um, authentication so that you can use a centralized server that you would have at your college. So we can use LDAP or SAML or Open Athens or one of the variety of authenticated systems that you, you, you may have. Uh, Coa works with most of them. Uh, similarly with SIP2 devices, be they self-check units, uh, entry gates, lap safe units, RFID pads, we can, we can connect those up to the COA server and uh, even though the SIP2 traffic is not encrypted we can provide a simple solution to make that the, the, that, that, that the case. Um, patron data feeds so uh, instead of having to manually import uh, details for, uh, for your students and your staff we can automate a feed from your registry system straight into the COA system which can get updated uh, daily or even hourly, uh, make sure that your, your patron data is always up to date. Uh, 
um, mobile application integration we can use, um, we can provide. So COA, the COA API can be included uh, in various mobile applications. Um, quite a lot of the colleges have a, a college-wide um, mobile app and we, we can include COA in that so that the students can check their um, uh, what library books they have got or what library notifications um, um, from within the app. Also, we can work with discovery service integration. So COA integrates with the discovery service. You can either use the COA OPAC to search COA and the discovery service, or you can include the COA data in the discovery service. We, we, we work with most of them, major discovery service uh, providers. Um, we also provide a Z3950 service, so you can, you can your server can act as a, a, a client, so you can download uh, catalog records from servers around the world. And also, if if you if you do desire, you can make your your catalog records a, 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 a available. Uh, we offer SMS integration, so that COA can uh, can can use SMS rather than email for notifications. That's popular with some of the, 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 the students. Um, and also electronic resource integration, so we can use COA as an authentication server for ebooks, and also you can upload in bulk some uh, um, the data from your ebook uh, provider. We can also offer other library functions, like upload uh, into library loans, uploads to union catalogues, and we, we can upload to, to to we can create a union catalogue for you and we can uh, upload to a national bibliographic uh, knowledge base so just so that's the um that's the uh, onboarding uh, if we move to the advantages and disadvantages of a hosted solution um what's nice with the solution we provide i think everyone knows their responsibilities um certainly i i used to work in uh, for a company that provided lms support which was uh, just support for the software not for the hardware or the operating system and what happened is there's often uh, a, a bit of a blame game that no one was quite clear on who was responsible for what I think now uh, with the solution that we're providing it's very clear is that uh, we, we look after all the technical aspects and you're left uh, just uh, running uh, the, the library management system the, the bit that you know best. Um, so some of the disadvantages that is the fear that you've lost control of your data. Uh, there's certainly the term, the cloud uh, does give the idea that the, 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 the data hosted in some, some vague entity somewhere. Uh, all our uh, data centers are, are UK based and we do know precisely what, um, um, where each of the servers are, are located. This makes sure that our uh, backups are secured in separate data centers and that we've got a disaster recovery plan for, uh, for, for your server if anything does go wrong. Um, on top of uh, what I've just spoken about, at, uh, at any time, PTFS will supply with a full backup of your data. Um, uh, we would we, supply that immediately uh, and that would actually be a useful backup compared to a lot of the proprietary um, library management systems because Cora is open source software so uh, any, any competent IT could, uh, technician could use that backup and verify uh, that the backup's correct or to use it to move away from the BTFS Europe support so there's no tie into our product at all. Um, so, um, yeah, as, as I said, um, what, uh, what we can do is that we are a set, a group of experts at PTFS, uh, running a library management system. I think previously you, you get IT, um, IT support staff who, uh, who are asked to look after the, um, library management system and that's not their top priority but I, th I think 
I think the, adv the, the main advantage is that you can call upon a group of experts such as our, ourselves and uh, we concentrate on one thing and hopefully do that one thing well. So uh, to, to move on to, to the third, uh, third part of the, of, of the talk, we'll talk about some of the enhancements to our service. Uh, what we like to think we, we do is that we like to th think we're the first to know of any problems with your system. We've got, uh, currently we've, we've got uh, an alerting service that, that checks on your server for a variety of, of, of potential problems. So that's CPU use, memory use, um, uh, hard disk use, when your certificate, uh, SSL certificates will expire, uh, whether certain processes are running or not. Now what we, we, we want to do and, and, and carry on is to increase those checks and to increase, um, increase uh, how much functionality that those checks uh, are carried out on. And that's some, something that, uh, that that we're going to be working on. And hopefully, um, though there is a very good help desk system, it does mean that we can, we can resolve problems before because they come apparent to yourselves and your users. Um, so the the, the other uh, the, the 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 next thing that we're we're, we're very keen on doing is to increase the quality of the auditing, change control, and documentation of procedures. Is that we're, we're we realise that um, with the uh, GDPR legislation and the uh, ISO audits, etc., that are carried out, is that um, although this is hidden to most of the end users, having uh, those controls in place, it does create trust that we are being very careful with the way your your data is handled and we're looking at increasing security checks on servers and also improving best practice training for our staff so we are very much uh, taking care of your data um, because you've you've shown that trust in us and also um, we are the, the the backup system, as we say, the part of the product does include a a, a, a backup regime. Uh, it's it does follow what we call a hosting uh, platform agnostic regime. This means that we could we we can switch hosting provider if needed. So that's it's, that's good. So that we if if we do hit a problem, we 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 we, we can quickly move. But we're, we're also starting to use. Um, other backup mechanisms so we can quickly to restore your systems to a point in time mm -hmm. so that before upgrades we have a, 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 a quick and efficient rollback method if there are any uh, if there are any problems with that uh, with that upgrade it does reduce risks uh, to, uh, to, to, um, with the, with the software that we provide so yes um if there are any questions do let us know uh if uh if you do think of anything later we're always happy to respond and to to to, to help you to clarify your thoughts at hosting at ptfs.com well thanks very much for your time um hopefully uh, you, you you'll be in touch in, in, in one way or another in the next in the next few months or so and uh, thank you very much
This session is all about MetaBase, and shortly I'll be joined by Penny Robertson and George Harkins of City of Glasgow College. But before that, I'm going to do a quick demo of the MetaBase system. So MetaBase is an open source business analytics tool that lets you ask questions of your data and display the answers in a range of different formats. It has a principle of allowing you to show those queries and visualizations on dashboards like this one here, or sending reports regularly to you by email or to Slack. Let's take a look at this dashboard then. This is themed around our library catalog, and you can see uh, that there are a number of different ways you can display queries. That's a pie chart, there are bar charts, simple numeric displays, tables, and line charts, and a number of different other visualizations. And you can collect them all together on a dashboard like this and share them within your organization with other MetaBase users or even externally via public uh, URLs. You can also note from this that um, we're pulling on two different databases. This particular pie chart here comes from our full Coa database, whereas this one here comes from our Coral ERM database. And MetaBase supports 13 different database types, including MySQL, MongoDB, and BigQuery. Now to create a query, you do something in MetaBase called ask a question. And there are three different ways you can do this. The first is via a simple question. First of all, you select the database you're interested in, and then I'm gonna choose the table within that database, the issues table, and uh, it's gonna ask me which uh, uh, dashboard I'd like to add this question to, but I'll, I'll do that later. Um, I'm gonna apply a filter to the, uh, to the data by the issue date. And I'm gonna say I'm interested in issues within the last 90 days, and let's include today, why not? Add that filter to the data. And then I'm gonna summarize the data via, by uh, branch code. Uh, it's chosen to display that as a bar chart, but I'm actually going to select instead a pie chart. So I've got issues within the last 90 days by branch, and I'm gonna save that question. We'll leave it with the name or well, actually why not give it a better name, issues in 90 days by branch. And I'm gonna save that. You could save it to a shared collection, but I'm gonna save it to my personal collection. And it's probably gonna ask me, yeah, if I'd like to add it to a dashboard. So again, I'll add it to my test dashboard. And this is a couple of items I added already but uh, there's the uh, pie chart I've just created. I'm gonna just expand it a bit to give it a bit more um, uh, space, uh, and then I'll save that dashboard. The other two ways of asking questions are either via a custom question, which is basically similar to the simple question, but allows you to join tables together and apply complex filtering and aggregation, and also custom columns. Or you could also write your own SQL or paste SQL in from reports that you've already created elsewhere. So in this case, I'm going to, again, take the data from the COA uh, database, um, and I'm just gonna copy the SQL from a, an existing COA report. So I popped over into COA. I'm gonna select that, ish, that SQL from this holds to pull uh, report and then I'm gonna paste that over into MetaBase and run that. And you can see it's pulled in some data there. There are a couple of holds to pull at the moment. I'm gonna save that, give it a name, holds to pull. And again, I can say where I'd like that to be saved. It's gonna ask me if I want to add it to a dashboard and yet why not, I'll add it to the test dashboard again and it's gonna pop it in there. And again, I can just shape it to, uh, to a suitable size like that and save the, uh, save the dashboard. So that's a quick whistle stop tour of MetaBase. I'm now gonna hand over to Penny and George who are going to give you a much more interesting, I'm sure, uh, insight into how MetaBase can be used 
uh, in an organisation like yours. Thanks, Andrew, and also thanks to PTFS for inviting us to share the evolution of our library data at City of Glasgow College. So as many of you out there know, statistics and quantitative data can make a difference for successfully achieving buy-in from your senior management for any change and or investment into your library service. So our journey towards Metabase really started in 2018 when we began to look more closely at the myriad of counting we as a team did for it then to lie dormant in a shared drive folder never to be utilised. It was collected with no strategic direction for any kind of service development. So this gives you an indication of the myriad of st stats and data that we collected. Um, you'll see by some of the dates, it goes back 10 years. Um, if we actually had a, a screenshot of the archive folder, you'd probably see it go back another 10 years further. So it wasn't really a pretty picture. And certainly from a manager's point of view, it was both labour intensive and rather more like a legacy activity in a library service rather than something that we could use for strategic development of our libraries. So we began analysing our collections of counts and decided how we could move forward, doing a lot of arguments along the way about what was internally facing and what was useful and really to begin to look at how we could streamline it and use it purposefully and publicly. And what we ended up with was this. So we realised some of it was internal and transactional via the library management system, and that really helped us to determine the development of our services. Some of the other data was kind of query and qualitative base, such as our issue desk tracker. And um, we used this to count the types of queries our library assistants field at service points. And other data was externally facing and it could have the potential to enhance other data that was being counted, reported and curated in the wider college landscape. So during this time, we'd also started looking at different systems and services out there that could help us deal with our library data. And we'd also recently moved to COA. It really couldn't have been better timing for us that Metabase became an interoperable system. So we went through our procurement process and between August and October, our library systems analyst, George, had managed to develop our first dashboards using Metabase. And we also worked with the college data expert to integrate our data board seamlessly within the wider college dashboard. And I'll pass on to George, who will take you through some of the dashboards that we have currently. George? OK, thanks, Penny. Um, well, here we have the patron and faculty level boards, and on the right side we assess, assess the transactions by faculty code. Uh, on the left hand side we have the registered accounts broken down by staff and students, and the student count is a dynamic total pulled in from our unit E student record system each day. And the next slide. Um, here we have the transaction counts recorded over each campus library at the top of the screen. And in the bottom half of the screen, we have the laptop and booth bookings. Um, the booth bookings helps quantify usage of one of the library's more socially demanding areas. And we have various reports in place to cover uh, and record this particular activity. Um, and the next board. Um, here we have the circulation data split by faculty and item type, so we can assess hard copy use against equipment and physical space, and credit where credit is due. Um, Bernard helped us considerably with this particular report. And the next one. Yeah, here we have SMS and notices, a, a board set up particularly to monitor this. Um, we only went live with text messaging, messaging in January, but we were able to integrate the reports from COA into Metabase. 
and this allowed us to assess the impact of text messaging in relation to the amount of final notices that were sent out. And, and over the eight weeks that we went live before lockdown, we noticed a dramatic decrease in the number of final notices that were sent out. And below this, we have a circulation and collection development board. And here we look at the items on location, um, the, and the renewals by location, and then the checkouts and renewals by faculty code over the academic year. And the next board. Yeah, here we have a metabase board that we import into the college dashboard system. So we set up a board specifically for this, and then we we get it to refresh every minute, and it's then pulled in via API into the college dashboard system. And then below this is a data set that we still record manually, um, the library visits, uh, the searches for content on the OPAC, and the services chart, which looks at library tours, workshops, and cite them right sessions. Okay, that's us. Brilliant. Cheers, George. Um, and so really to the future, um, what we're looking to do next is probably integrate our digital resource data and, and, and begin to look at how we can capture teacher uh, um, teaching activities. Um, George and I certainly want to develop the faculty based dashboards for teaching staff because um, we want to see how we can create any kind of analytics and inference between their data and ours that could potentially aid the student journey. And we also intend to continue enjoying the power that MetaBase gives us for any kind of justifying of the need for a quality library service at City of Glasgow College. So that's our um, presentation done and we're both here um, and available for any questions that you might have. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Janet. I'm Director of Operations at PTFS Europe. I have a background in academic libraries and one of my roles at the company is to oversee COA library management system implementations. Sam has already given us a really good overview of the implementation at Leeds City College. I'd just like to expand on our implementation process. So whether your requirement is a fast track implementation or something a little more leisurely, we will be able to, working with you, accommodate that. So our implementation timetable. There are, as you can see, several factors that need to be carried out in order to affect a good project. Starting with a project planning meeting. This is the point where we get together and with all relevant parties, plan out the timetable of events for that project. One of the, um, the agenda for that project planning meeting pretty much covers some of the other, topic, the other topics on that list there. One of the outcomes of the planning, planning meeting will be the production of a project planning document that we'll refer back to throughout the weeks. So data migration and conversion is a key element to carrying out an implementation. Data needs to be extracted and then migrated into the new COA system. As such, we need to establish rules for that mapping of data. And that is one of the key elements of the configuration workshop, which is another milestone. At the configuration workshop, we'll look at data mapping, but also mapping policies in the new system. After the workshop, you have a period of review where you can think about those policy mappings. But once they're established, we can build a configuration onto your new COA installation and then carry out the core training. So core training will be carried out by your trainer. It's modular driven and it will give you the skills to then carry out your own cascade training of library staff for people who couldn't attend the core training. But it will also give you the tools and knowledge of the system so that you can undertake your user testing with confidence. So user testing is really important because this gives you a, a way a, point to look at your data, look at your configuration, look at any look and feel aspects and any questions or changes or requests can be channeled through feedback approaches, usually a spreadsheet, but we ensure that we monitor any feedback and make take any measures to, um, to fulfill whatever needs you need. Um, so Alongside all of those elements, there are concurrent activities ongoing, and these generally relate to IT um, issues such as authentication, or setting up self-issue machines, or establishing um, integration with your discovery layers. All of those elements can be ongoing throughout the project timeline, but they generally involve IT involvement. So we know how busy IT departments are in, in, in your um, establishments. So although the time required for that involvement may not be huge, we still need to factor in and timetable in any requirements that need IT input. And finally, go live is an important milestone. It may be there may be constraints that give you a fixed date for a go live point. It could be the cessation of a current contract with your LMS supplier, or it could be dovetailing in with the summer vacation in colleges. Either way, we can work with you to meet that timeline. So let's have a look at the project meeting key thing is to bring your diaries bring along uh, and also in attendance will be any key personnel who can feed into those bullet points that we just looked at as you can see there's a lot to pack in but we've a lot of experience of um, projects of different lengths so this slide gives us an idea of a basic outline of events we can see that this is a 
three month project um, and we can we've run them shorter we've run them longer we're starting in May and we can see each of the different um, milestones here. We're extracting the data following the project meeting that feeds into the ability to run the workshop. Once we've run the workshop, we can apply the configuration, which means the data can be converted and then training can commence. Now, if I click out into our Instagant um, diagram here, um, it gives us a more interactive feel of what's going on in the project. So if I scroll along to the right, we can see in this instance, live running is um, towards the end of August. And at the moment here, we've got a testing time of four weeks um, if that were pushed any longer. So if you require more testing time obviously that's going to have a knock-on effect on your live running unless that's a fixed date so it's just to illustrate that if there are extra requirements or if there's any reason to extend or shorten different elements of the project then there will be um, we need to ensure that there's wriggle room basically we need to build in slack to make sure that there is plenty of time to undertake each of the different elements so I'll go back now into the slideshow. So just to let, just to keep everybody up to date, we provide documentation throughout the project from the project plan. We provide testing plans. We will also supply training scenarios to assist with your cascade training. We'll manage feedback and continuous and, and continually through the project we have regular project calls to bring in key personnel so that everybody knows what they're doing and making sure that everything is on track so just some factors to consider um, you need to allow time for data checking and sam it reiterated that earlier on Staff need to get accustomed to the new system, to new workflows, new ways of doing things, potentially new policy names. Cascade training is important to factor in. We also, um, if required, run workshops to help guide you when you're thinking about cascade training. As systems admins, you need to become familiar with the configurations that have been um, decided and think about making any changes so you're ready to go live. So that could be tweaking circulation rules and so on. And finally, be aware that you need to involve IT departments uh, so that they're aware and around for authentication and any self-service testing, for example. <clears throat> so finally, um, whether your requirement is a speedy project or longer, the important thing is we will work with you to ensure there's enough time for each aspect. Um, so we'll deliver to your time scale, but we'll maintain flexibility. And I think that pretty much covers the basics of implementation. Thanks very much for listening. If you've got any questions for me, please put them in the chat. Thank you.
Well, we hope you've enjoyed our PTFS Europe Festival today, and we hope you found the content interesting and informative and has given you something to take away and think about. I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, Janet, Lucy, Fiona, John, and Andrew from PTFS Europe, and for Sam Goldsmith from the University Centre Leeds, and Penny Robertson and George Harkins from the City of Glasgow College. If you do think of anything subsequently and would like to contact us, then please use our email, email address, which is shown on the screen, and we'll be more than happy to come back to you and answer any questions that you may have. So it only remains for me to say thank you for staying for the full two hours. As we said earlier, the presentations will be recorded and will be available later. So please stay at home and stay safe. We look forward to speaking to you very soon.